would it be okay for someone to take your land away from you? You can probably think of very few instances where this would be tolerable. However, in some developing countries, it is perfectly legal for the government to come and take your house or your land, and this can be done for a number of reasons. When the economy changes, it produces winners and losers. At the heart of this change is land and the way it gets used. This presents an important dilemma in the developing nations and the world more broadly. On the one hand, you've got agriculture farmers who want the government to maintain their agricultural interests in the land. On the other side, you've got industrial and commercial interests who want the government to acquire the lands so that they can develop and move forward. This led me to an interesting question. How is it that the government can mediate the interests between agriculture and industry with respect to land? In order to understand this, I had ventured to West Bengal, India, where over 3,000 hectares of land was acquired forcibly to create a massive futuristic township on the periphery of Kolkata. This first picture is one I took of the new township of Rajarhat. It shows the juxtaposition between how the government plans on using the lands and how it was previously used. In the foreground, you've got paddy fields where, the government, where farmers continue to till their lands despite eviction requests from the government. In the backdrop, you've got partially completed high-rise condominium buildings. This next picture shows some farmers who refused to leave despite government requests to ev demands evicting them. They refuse to vacate until the government either compensates them or at the very least gives them somewhere else to go. In Newtown Rajarhat, forceful land acquisition caused the displacement of over 100,000 farmers. I went, I, while I was there, I did a field study and I had spent six months doing research. I'd collected over 100 interviews with governmental officials, CEOs, leaders of NGOs, and of course the farmers themselves. I went through extraordinary lengths to collect both public and confidential government documents. At the time I arrived in the field, land acquisition was an inflammatory subject. The 33-year reign of the longest standing democratically elected communist government in the world had come to an end. And land acquisition, the very issue I decided to study, was at the core of this political change. This next slide shows the Roger Hutt farmers protesting on the eve of the West Bengal election. So you can imagine how difficult and at times dangerous it was to get the information I did. Now let me tell you about the remarkable story of Roger Hutt. The stated purpose for the Roger Hutt development was in order to relieve the city of Kolkata of its many burdens, such as over congestion, choking air population, poverty alleviation, a lot of the problems you would associate with any large city. However, the reality for the site selection of Roger Hutt was essentially based on a shallow two-prong criteria. Basically, its proximity to the airport and to the main city of Kolkata. Keeping this in mind, let's have a look at a video of how the West Bengal government has been advertising this new township. Surrounded by the pristine beauty of nature, Natural surroundings everywhere you look. The workplace just a walk away. The best schools and colleges down the road. With the best amenities right next door for you. Lifestyle. Work. Comfortable living, delivering the best of both worlds, is our endeavor. New Town, 
is the future of all satellite cities. Promoted by W.B. Hitko, a wholly owned company of the government of West Bengal, in association with joint venture partners. This begs the question, who is the new township being built for? There are an important few things to note from this video. It was delivered in the English rather than native language, and it adheres to a standard of living that only a sliver of the population would ever be able to afford. It's clear from this video that the new town Roger Hudd development would be enormously expensive. But what's truly unique is this entire project would be self-financed through a series of public-private partnerships and the selling of lands. The government's interest in this township was pretty obvious. They felt that they would not only provide a practical response to the, develop, to the problems facing Kolkata, but they would also be able to provide a symbol for the future of the West Bengal economy and what it could achieve. Private developers, when I interviewed them, they told me there was no way they'd be able to create massive infrastructure projects without the government mediating the interests between landowners and business. This is especially the case in the West Bengal context, where the population density is so high and land ownings are so small. It's simply not viable for, individual develop for developers to go and negotiate with individual farmers. So when the new town development started becoming evident, farmers started protesting. They felt they were not adequately compensated and that there was no space for them in the new town development. The government had claimed that this was a participatory process. However, in all my investigations, I could not find even a shred of evidence to support this claim. In fact, the overwhelming conclusion that I reached from the dearth of committee meeting minutes, newspaper articles, policy documents, and one-on-one -on -one interviews I connect conducted was that this process was entirely driven through a hierarchical top-down fashion and there was not even a thread of consent required. So many of you might wonder, how is it that the government can forcibly acquire the lands of so many people? Well, in order to do this, the government of West Bengal has enacted the 1894 Land Acquisition Act of India. This archaic and colonial act essentially allows the government to acquire lands at any time so long as it's within a stated public purpose. In order to expedite the process, the government had invoked the emergency clause, despite the fact that there was no real emergency at play. Uh, furthermore, they had, instead of acquiring the entire 3,000 hectares of land all at once, they did it in a piecemeal fashion, where they took little segments, eventually taking the entire area. And this way, the farmers wouldn't have the opportunity to realize what's going on, coming together, resisting and protesting. They would have no way to unite. Now, the farmers unfortunately had very few legal rights in this process, which is why they were given rights way below market value. For this reason, NGOs, political activists, came together and they filed a case in court against the government based on their environmental violations to the lands. The first court case went through and the ruling was the Roger Hutt development should not take place until proper environmental clearances are met. When the government decided to overstep their boundaries, a second court case was filed based on the same violation. Here the outcome was very different. This time the judge ruled that the Roger Hutt development must go on and not developing would be equivalent to going back to the Stone Ages. It was later discovered that this judge had himself owned land in Roger Hutt and the way he got it was through the chairman's quota. The chairman's quota is potentially the most controversial aspect of this new town development. It essentially allows the chairman, who is the head of the administrative body responsible for the new development, to have 10% of the lands in all of Rajarhat to redistribute to people of his choosing. This next slide shows the people who would be eligible for the chairman's quota. 
the chairman had strategically used this power in order to redistribute lands to all the most influential members of Kulkan society. This includes judges, lawyers, media personnel, notable academics, government officials, even film stars, just about anyone who has a big enough sway on the society as a whole. And perhaps the most astonishing part of this chairman's quota is that it's not some form of hidden backroom governmental corruption, but widely accepted public knowledge. Now, while the court cases were in some way put forward in order to slow down the development process, there were real environmental concerns at play. The natural slope of Kolkata is from the east to the west, the, allowing during the monsoon season for the rainwaters to flow through there, through canals such as these ones that exist in Rajarhat, and eventually go to the ocean. Now, when the Rajarhat development began, they decided to actually fill in many notable water bodies and raise the lands of Roger Hutt, filling them in. You can imagine how this would disrupt the natural ecology and the environmental of the area. So you have problems such as this. This picture was taken with a poor quality camera a few years into the Roger Hutt development, inundation. This is when floods reached a record high and the situation is definitely much, much worse today. Now, despite the overwhelming legal authority of the government, perhaps the most surprising element of this new township development is how delayed the process has become. Infrastructure development is way behind schedule. This is partially due to a master plan that's cont continuously evolving and ever-changing, trying to get it perfect. This has to do largely with corruption, where local party hacks were given the opportunity to control the supply of goods and services and materials in Roger Hutt development in exchange for their patronage, and it has to do with local resistance. While the majority of the Roger Hutt development was going to have its electrical wires running underground anyway, these cables nearby a power plant actually had to be submerged due to local resistors clipping the above ground wires. So many of you might wonder, what is Roger Hutt like today? Well, it's not much different from its time of conception. It's still being marketed as a modern, futuristic city, one where you can live a Western standard of living right in India. Rich elites and wealthy foreigners come from all over the world to invest in properties that are undeveloped, and they see it as an investment purpose purely based on speculation. Even today, if you were to go to Roger Hutt, all you would see is one main arterial road going from the city of Kolkata through the township of Roger Hutt and to the airport. This is not an uncommon sight there today. Long, vast, empty spaces intermittently punctuated by half-finished high-rise luxury condominiums and up empty upscale shopping centers. Land acquisition would appear to be the most efficient way of achieving rapid economic transformation. However, when I reached Roger Hutt, I was shocked to discover that the farmers were not adequately compensated, that the environmental concerns were completely sidelined, and there was an absence of democratic participation. It is partially due to these reasons and gross governmental corruption that decades after conception, the project is still only under construction. So how is it moving forward? How can we acquire land in a fair and just way? Well, we can make sure that the farmers are adequately compensated and that they're still able to maintain or secure a livelihood. Some ways we can do this is to include them in the decision-making process, allow them to extract shares or profits from future returns on the land, and retrain them for the new economy. The government of West Bengal has yet to learn these lessons as they have recently terminated the probe into the land acquisition scandal before it even got started, offering no suggestions of why. 
The government of India, however, has taken, into some, taken some of these elements into consideration in the new Land Acquisition Act they passed just a couple months ago. Many of the objections related to the question, how is it that someone can take my house, my farm, or my land, have yet to be answered and can lead to serious problems moving into the future. It is inevitable that with changing economies, land will need to be repurposed. This has the potential to displace millions of people and therefore needs to be done in a fair and just way. This includes getting democratic consent and moving forward with a development strategy where no one is left behind.